their coach and the boys all came together and, and, and discussed staying strong, having that will to live, having the will to survive. But I think it's, it's more appropriate because it's actually more involved. The mouth of the cave was dry when we arrived, and within an hour and a half it had already filled up at least two to three feet, and we were being pushed out. Uh, and that was just in the very beginning of the cave, and I think at that point we realized that this problem was going to be much more complex than we originally thought. That the condition of the air in the cave was deteriorating, so that really started to kind of put a sense of urgency with, with one, realizing that the long-term survivability of the boys in the cave was becoming a less and less feasible option. In this type of cave diving, you have to lay line or rope, that's your lifeline, so without that, you have no idea of uh, disorientation. You're underwater and, and you, the water is completely muddy, so you have to ensure that when you go in, you have a way out. So they were making progress, but it was very little progress, and they were exhausting themselves, spending anywhere from four, five, and six hours, and, and maybe covering 40 meters, 50 meters. We had to basically uh, set up uh, rope systems and high lines to be able to, you know, safely put them in a harness and bring them across uh, large open areas uh, so they wouldn't have to try to go all the way down. If we jam the cylinders with 80% oxygen instead of just regular room air, that would plus up their oxygen saturation levels and, and that would really be good for the, their mental state. I think the world just needs to know that what was accomplished was a, a once-in-a-lifetime rescue that I think has never been done. Uh, we were extremely fortunate that the outcome was the way it was. If you, if you lose your cool, especially in an environment like that, uh, there, there's a lot of bad repercussions.